Today, I'm going to be um, telling you a bit about uh, a network of Central Asian Islamic scholars in the 18th through early 20th centuries. This knowledge network was not the product of any particular state or empire, nor was it institutionalized, institutionalized into a self-consciously collective body. Rather, it was a kind of shared scholarly dialogue, a common culture of learning, an educational network, uh, and an integrated canon of texts and concomitant thought world. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to try and offer a sense of what this heat map of scholarly mobility actually represents and how we might understand it. Uh, so I'm going to come back to it. But first, some background, because I realize that uh, um, Central Asian history is going to be quite familiar to many people in the audience. Uh, so let me briefly offer some context. So again, I'm going to come back to this. So as we enter the 18th century, the era of sprawling empires of the steppe that you might have heard of, such as the, the Mongols or the Timurids, that age has decidedly come to an end. Instead, what we have is essentially a fragmented landscape of vassals, city-states, aspiring empires, uh, even a map such as this one that I have here, which already has, seems to have a lot of borders going on, uh, you know, it conceals a much more complicated arena of layered negotiated forms of sovereignty, so very fragmented politically. The political landscape is scarcely any less complicated following the Russian conquest uh, beginning in the 1860s, which comes squarely in the middle of my period of research. During this period, much of Central Asia fell under Russian military rule, which you can see there shaded in purple. But some of the city-states uh, on the previous map persevered as Russian protectorates. One of those protectorates was Bukhara, which is named after its capital city, which is also the, ge the geographic epicenter of my own research. In terms of culture, language, and literature, Central Asia was situated within a much larger sphere that was at once that was simultaneously Ar Arabophone, uh, Persephone, and Turkophone. You can think of uh, Persian language and culture in this territory as, as maybe something like Latin and medieval and early modern Europe. It was a language and associated literature that virtually all educated people could read and write, but not necessarily the language that most people spoke in daily life. By the 19th century, Turkic was increasingly emerging as a literary vernacular uh, in its own right, and it should not be forgotten that Arabic remained an important language of scholarship alongside Persian into the 20th century. This large Persian zone that I have on the screen here represents a space permeated by a common language, common set of texts, and a common thought world, but it's not necessarily a region in which it was common for individuals to physically move from one end to the other, to the other and it did not necessarily represent a network of pen pals or anything like that. So my own work is about a smaller zone of actual human exchange and interaction within this larger zone nested in it. And in a sense, uh, borrowing the terminology of this, of this webinar series, I'll be talking about a Bukharan Republic of letters uh, within this larger Perso-Islamic space. Now, uh, I'll also say a quick, quick word about this concept of Republic of letters, which, you know, like, like uh, as David said, in his case, is, is not a way that I've thought too much about my work, but the, is it the concept anchoring the series. Um, you know, I do mention it briefly in my book as, as I think is an apt metaphor for these uh, Bukharan intellectual networks. And now, uh, in my field, uh, the scholar who has most fruitfully employed this conceptual lens is actually Evren Bimbash, who's in the audience and who we're going to be hearing from uh, next week. And I'm actually, I hope I'm not uh, preempting him here, but I can actually quote briefly from Bimbash's book because I think he does a, a great job of succinctly and elegantly adapting the concept of the Islamic, you know, of the Republic of Letters to an Islamic con uh, context. He explains this, so this quote is from his book, Intellectual Networks in Timur, Iran, where he defines the Republic of Letters as, quote, uh, an informal intellectual network based on personal context, communication, or correspondence between the participants. And this is the part that I think is important for the Islamic context, unlike formal networks, such as Sufi networks, for instance. Informal networks almost never inscribed their presence in hagiographies, genealogies, or certificates, ijazas. Now, this framework fits this case that I'm going to talk about pretty well, which comes as no surprise since the intellectuals of Bukhara in the 19th century were the direct heirs of the cultural world of the Timurid period in the heart of Bimbash's work, which we're going to hear about again next week. <clears throat> 
So the remainder of my presentation is going to proceed, you know, with what little time I have, I'm going to proceed in three parts. First, I'm going to offer a general sense of the texture of this intellectual network, you know, how Islamic scholars in this period engaged with one, one another, what it looked and felt like. Then I'm going to return to that heat map that I, that I put on the screen in the beginning to give a sense of where this network extended. Uh, you know, if you got your education in an Islamic college in Bukhara, where could that curriculum take you? And finally, most briefly, I'll offer an explanation of how Bukhara as a city came to be, came to be the pivot of this intellectual network, the center of it. So, at least in my understanding, one of the central ideas of the Republic of Letters is the letter part. Uh, you know, it can, it can refer to written communication between people living far away from another, one another without necessarily interacting face to face. And this kind of correspondence was indeed one facet of intellectual life in Central Asia during its long 19th century. As an example, in 1878, a scholar named Muhammad Hisari uh, came down with an illness and he spent several weeks recuperating under the care of uh, physicians in one of Bukhara's provinces. During his convalescence, Hisari exchanged lengthy uh, Persian poetic verses with a, with a friend uh, living in Samarkand uh, they were even finishing one another's verses uh, remotely via courier. So in this example, the, the genre of, of poetry was the Safi Nama, which is a kind of uh, erotic wine poetry. And so it's, makes, it's very appropriate that Hisari note, notes in his memoir that he was drinking a kind of uh, licit, you know, legal, watered down uh, alcoholic beverage as he enjoyed this poetry, uh, poetic communicate back and forth with his friend. That said, Direct evidence of this kind of uh, remote courier-based correspondence, like I just described, is actually fairly rare, at least in the sources that I work with. More often, we're dealing with physical travel and in-person interaction. For instance, uh, the world of the modulus uh, that Helen Pfeiffer described in her we webinar presentation in this series uh, in the Ottoman context was very much alive and well in 19th century Central Asia. Just as in the Ottoman context, these moduluses were sites of non-state intellectual exchange where careers were made with a clever philosophical insight and enemies were vanquished with a sharp poetic couplet. And one stri uh, you know, particularly striking account of a modulus, uh, there was a theological debate. And the subject up for debate was the question of whether Mary, mother of Jesus, was authentically a prophet in the Islamic tradition. Uh, this, is a, this is a common debate, not only in Central Asia, throughout the Islamic world. But the stakes of the debate were actually pretty close to home. The Central Asian scholar in question was intent on proving that Mary performed a category of miracle not specific to prophets as a way of defending the miracles performed by later, later Sufi saints of his own order, which was a way of legitimating the increasingly controversial practice of, sh of shrine visitation. In other words, the, the scholar was using the figure of Mary instrumentally to prove that not all miracles were the specific purview of prophets, uh, which is of course Im important in the Islamic tradition because Muhammad was the final prophet. And this in turn made the miracles of Sufi saints in his own order squarely within bounds. This gives you a sense of what these moduluses were, were, were all about. But the most, you know, so the moduluses are another one side of in, in intellectual exchange, but there's a, a related one that's most central to my, my work as a, as a, a locus of trans-regional uh, intellectual exchange, which is uh, where the Islamic colleges or madrasas, and they're associated adjacent centers of learning, such as Sufi lodges and mosques. There's an idea of what those look like. So these physical institutions anchored an interconnected constellation of educational forums, from the you know, ranging from the formal madrasa study circle to informal training that took place at mosques and thrine, uh, shrines throughout the region. Okay, so hopefully that gives a, a slight, some a glimpse into the, the texture of this intellectual exchange in the 19th century, 19th century Central Asia. Now let's uh, come back to the regional network part of that, uh, of that equation. So where did people come from in, in order to study in Bukhara? Where, did, where were people actually traversing from in order to have these exchanges? So this heat map is visualizing the geographic origins of the most influential scholars uh, in Bukhara in the 19th century. And that qualifier I just used is important. These numbers only reflect the geographic origins of scholars who chose to remain in Bukhara. And then not only that, but then rose to the top of the, of the intellectual hierarchy there. The numbers uh, depicted on this map do not uh, 
capture the many, many more students who studied in a, a Bukharan madrasa and then returned home because I don't have those numbers. Um, but still, I do think that these numbers tell us something important. And in fact, you know, whether or not a scholar was able to make it, you know, to, to advance their career in Bukhara is central in my argument about how we ought to understand regional cultural dynamics during this time period. So you'll notice immediately from this map that the majority of the upper strata of uh, Islamic scholars originated from the Bukharan oasis itself, the immediate vicinity. No surprises there. It's also no, not too surprising to see strong representation from the Fergana Valley uh, and the mountainous territories of Tajikistan, or what is now Tajikistan. Um, maybe slightly more surprising is the fact that Northern Afghanistan, what we think of today as, as maybe even in a separate region, is much more strongly represented than even Khwarezm, which is uh, you know, today within the same country. So the modern area studies and, and, and country borders aren't helping too much for this map. So how do we explain the contours of this regional educational network? So I argue that two main factors uh, help us understand this. One was the, the, the degree of overlap in the curriculum uh, taught in Bukhara and other Islamic centers of learning. And the other is the presence of competing educational centers where someone might go for their education instead of Bukhara. So let's uh, start with the first of those. So much of the core madrasa curriculum in Bukhara was not unique to Bukhara. The same Arabic texts that form the core of the curriculum in Bukhara were taught elsewhere. For instance, and you can actually kind of quantify this because we have, so we have a pretty good idea of what was taught in madrasas elsewhere. So for instance, there was about a 50% overlap with the curriculums taught in India and the Ottoman Empire respectively. So this is a transferable skill set. Students could come to Bukhara from very far away and still find skills and form of knowledge, forms of knowledge that would be useful back home. However, for most Islamic scholars, the core madr madrasa curriculum you know, that, was, that was taught in the formal madrasa study circles was only the tip of the iceberg. They would need to continue learning other disciplines outside of their formal training. And it was in these more advanced disciplines, things like poetry, Sufi philosophy, occult sciences. It was there that we start to see a more specialized regional canon of texts. And this in turn shaped who had an, intent, an incentive to travel to Bukhara for collegiate study instead of somewhere else. For example, the Kievan Khanate of Khwarezm was far more Turkic-centric in terms of language, whereas Bukharan learning was more wound up in Persian writing. Both, both regions used both, but just in terms of uh, the preponderance. Both subregions did share the same core of Arabic texts, but, the, forms, uh, but the, the point of this is that the forms of knowledge cultivated in Bukhara were maybe slightly less transferable to Khwarezm than they were to say, Northern Af what is now Northern Afghanistan. And sure enough, we see this reflected in the geographic origins of Bukhara's ulama in this map. This is also why Muslims from the Volga Urals region of Russia and from Western China or Xinjiang traveled to Bukhara in the thousands to study in the, in the, in the city's madrasas. When they, re, when they returned home, many of those forms of knowledge that they learned in Bukhara were fully transferable. But because those territories tended to be more Turkic oriented in terms, in terms of languages, Muslims from Russia and Xinjiang tended not to rise to the top of the Bukharan hierarchy of scholars, even though they, again, they came in the thousands to, to study there and then return home. So given that uh, Bukhara share, shared an emphasis on scholarship in the Persian language with Iran, one might expect to see many Iranian scholars to turn up in Bukharan madrasas. And there were some Iranian people from Iran present. After all, the, uh, you know, the Iranian uh, madrasa curriculum overlapped with the Bukharan one by around 30%, which is significant. So there's significant overlap in terms of what people are reading and learning. However, towards the end of the curriculum and the, the Bukharan madrasas, students began to learn legal principles. And that is where uh, the, the fact that Bukhara is in the Hanafi school of law, uh, which is different from Shiite Iran, becomes important. So even though Iran was actually, you know, geographically closer to Bukhara than, uh, than Russia was. And even though Iran and Bukhara shared a Persephone high culture, far more Muslims from Russia and China ended up studying in Bukhara's madrasas. So what about India and the Ottoman Empire? Now this is where the second part of the explanation comes in. The presence of competing educational centers claiming to be every bit as central for their own regions as Bukhara was for greater Central Asia. So some people are surprised that you know, the, the number of Ottoman scholars who end up settling in Bukhara 
and rising to the top is very slim, uh, vanishingly slight. So Bukhara did not train that many Ottoman scholars for the simple reason that the Ottoman Empire had its own madrasas catering to the specific needs of that empire and region, which only partially overlapped with Central Asia. India stands as an interesting in-between case. India was Hanafi in terms of legal school and also Persephone in terms of its high culture. And its curriculum overlapped with Bukhara almost exactly. So very, very similar curriculums. And indeed, we do see significant numbers of Indian students turning up in Bukharan madrasas, even though they do not tend to rise to the upper ranks of the Bukharan ulama, of the Bukharan Islamic scholars. However, India boasted plenty of its own educational centers, so there was no need to send students in significant numbers to study in Bukhara. Indians came to, to Central Asia in huge numbers for other reasons, things like merchant networks uh, and Sufi networks, um, but not necessarily to study and to go to college, so to speak. Okay, so now let's uh, turn to this, this third question, which is, how did this intellectual exchange network centered on Bukhara come to be in the first place? How did the, what I just, what was the history behind what I just, just described? So Bukhara is an ancient city. And even today, the, the city cultivates a kind of aura of timelessness. Uh, it really plays up this, this uh, claim to antiquity. Uh, it has titles like Bukhara Sharif, uh, which is Bukhara the Noble. Uh, so Bukhara has become a, a symbol of, of splendor situated in a, in a deep past. Uh, so there's a, mytholo there's a mythologization project of um, antiquity. But in fact, the 19th century, even under colonial subjugation, was in some ways the culmination of Bukhara's cultural, religious, and educational efflorescence. So this was partly a material process actualized through brick and mortar. It was also an intellectual project that sought to explain Bukhara's centrality in sacred Islamic history and also Persian epic uh, uh, and to actively promote that idea. And these were not understood to be separate things. Today, I'm just, you know, because of time, I'm only gonna, mostly gonna talk about the infrastructure part of that equation, but it was more than that. It was, a, it was an active uh, process of myth-making uh, to sort of claim that Bukhara was always, always a, 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 um, a peerless city, uh, center of Islam. Okay, so this is a, a, map, a graph of madrasa con construction, uh, sort of the development of ed educational infrastructure in, in Bukhara. So what does this tell us? Well, most of Bukhara's largest, physically largest monu monuments, ones like this one I just showed here, right? The really famous madrasas uh, were, just, were, were constructed during the early modern period, uh, you know, between the 16th and 18th centuries. But in terms of raw numbers of, of madrasas, uh, it's actually the 19th and early 20th century that really stand out. This is when Bukhara's raw capacity in terms of basically dorm rooms, that's, what, that's what's uh, being depicted on this graph, uh, really shoots up. And you see that as you know, the cumulative number of cells or dorm rooms uh, on, the blue, on the blue line there, right? So, that, so um, in the time period of my research, Bukhara's educational capacity to serve as a trans-regional hub for students shoot, skyrockets. So this map, uh, this is the city of Bukhara, this is the physical layout. It conveys actually the same, essentially the same information as the previous graph, but in a sort of spatial layout of the city. So you can get a sense of where things are. Each circle represents one madrasa or Islamic college, but the size of the madrasa is relative to the number of dorm rooms available for students. Red circles represent madrasas constructed during the long 19th century, the period of my research. Uh, and the purple circles represent madrasas constructed during the 16th or 18th centuries. And as you can see for yourself, uh, the early modern madrasas are much larger uh, in terms of, of uh, capacity. And, you know, the, and they're the most famous ones, again, that the tourists visit today. Um, but the more numerous 19th century structure, constructions, um, such as this one, were, were also not unimpressive and they served their function just fine, which was, was, uh, which was again, Making uh, ensuring that, that that Bukhara served as a as a as a the the the, the nexus of this uh, Republic of Letters. It's it's worth pointing out that this infrastructure you and you might notice this from the graph. This infrastructure uh, project only picks up speed during the colonial periods. So the colonial period is not a rupture in the way you might expect. Um, so it's also okay. So in terms of raw capacity, uh, when we're thinking about non-state networks, non-imperial networks. In terms of raw numbers, uh, Bukhara's educational uh, capacity was on the scale, same level of, as Istanbul, uh, 
despite the fact that Bukhara as a, as a fairly small city state was nowhere near the size of the Ottoman Empire, obviously, but that was because it was serving a much larger educational network uh, depicted in those earlier maps of the of, uh, earlier heat maps of the region. So um, I hope that offers, oops, I hope that offers some sense of the intellectual networks uh, in Central Asia on the eve of modernity. Um, you know how well this this uh, this maps to the European context of the Republic of Letters. Republic of Letters is not for me to say, but it, what's clear is that Bukhara was the locus of a of a world of intellectual exchange nested within a much larger uh, world of shared uh, culture. 19th century Bukhara was not unique in this regard. There were lots of other centers uh, of these kinds of networks that also built upon uh, Perso-Islamic intellectual culture. So Bukhara, the, 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 this Bukharan Republic of Letters was not the first of its kind, but it was very close to the last of its kind. Because you know, e even though this network survived and even thrived during the Russian colonial period, it came to a decisive end with the Bolshevik conquest in 1920. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening.